I remember over the years that you get to this time of year and it's kind of interesting what the mass media has always kind of chosen to do with it. Uh, you know, it, it's, like, it's like they feel it necessary to try to discredit the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I remember uh, seeing in the LA Times one time, um, you know, it was on the third page. You just open up the front page of the LA Times and there in great big bold letters, huge letters right across the top, theologians now agree, Jesus did not rise, you know? And then they said, the most eminent theologians in our country all now fully understand and realize he didn't really rise from the dead. And you, you, you see, our, it seems like they were, uh, you know, they, they had to come up with, with, with articles along that line right about this time of the year. I remember uh, seeing an article just, you know, it's just been a few years ago now, where a big discovery, they discovered in, in Palestine an old, uh, you know, grave area, an old tomb area, and there right on, the, right on the caskets were Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. And they, that's it, we found his grave, you know? He's not risen from the dead. Well, two things about that. First of all, those were extremely con con common names in that era. It would be like if we were down in Mexico, for instance, finding some, a, a family grave to, to Jose, Maria, and Jesus. It would be about like that. Or in our country, it would be, and they only used first names at the time, it would be like, like Joe, Mary, and, and John. I mean, you know, so that doesn't hold any weight at all. And furthermore, uh, Jesus had brothers, the Bible tells us, and if it was a family tomb, you know, the question is, well, Where's, where's the rest of the gang? You know, where's, uh, I've got their names written down here, yeah. Um, James, Joseph, Simon, Judas, you know, they were conspicuously absent. So, you know, you always get things like that. I've noticed it seems like more recently, uh, they're choosing to, as much as possible, just ignore what Easter is really about in the mass media. It's interesting that when I was growing up, and I think pretty much for my kids, uh, the Easter vacation was set aside for that week before Easter that began with Palm Sunday and had Good Friday and then Easter Sunday. And, and that's the reason it was even celebrated, and that's the reason the schools took the time off. And they've changed that now, uh, more recently, to spring break, to just a divest it of any connection to Easter at all. And they, and they move it around. They, 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 they move it at different times of the spring, so just keep it away from Easter. They, they just want it to be ignored. And so we live in a world, we live in a society where the, this event, this resurrection, is either, either just out and out denied or it's, or it's ignored. But I want to go on record that I, for one, and along with a worldwide mass of sincere and honest and, and basically intelligent people are absolutely convinced He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. It's like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, and that's why I had you turn there. He says there, verse 1, notice, 1 Corinthians 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand by which you also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you of first, uh, first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, then by the twelve, after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present. They're still living, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, and then by all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of, out of due time. He was sort of the last one to arrive along there. Now look at verse 12. With that in mind, he says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. 
And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. The word empty means void of anything. There's absolutely nothing there. You know, it's worthless, it's lifeless, it's youthless, it's a great big zero. That's what he means by that. Now, uh, brethren, what he's saying here is that, first of all, that our faith, our hope, our eternal life rests on the fact of the resurrection. I remember uh, talking to a college kid. I had shared at a, at a uh, comparative religions class at, at a college, and, and I was talking to this, this kid afterwards, and a couple things he said absolutely astounded me. One was this. He was an American kid, raised in America and everything. He grew up in the public school system when, when Easter vacation was Easter vacation. And he said to me after the class, he said, he said, Pastor, you said that Jesus rose from the dead. I said, yeah. I said, I didn't know that. What? Raised in America? You know? knew about Easter and all that, and you didn't know that Jesus rose from the dead? I'd never heard that. I didn't know that. It astounded me that somebody could be raised in this country and not know at least the fact of the resurrection. But here's the second thing that blew me away, and he was so spot on. He said, if that's really true, that's what makes the difference in all the religions of the world. Amen to that. And Paul is saying here, if this is not true, I mean, it, 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 it's this fact that our, that, that, that our faith is, is absolutely rests on. And the other thing here is uh, <clears throat> that Paul is making, uh, it, it is making a case for the resurrection here. He said, I can list the people who are still living today that saw him risen. That's what he's saying. And he said, I saw him myself. And I've written it, I put it in writing here. I saw the risen Jesus Christ. And then he adds in verse 14, and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. If he's not risen, truly risen, there's two outcomes here. The preaching, all the preaching that's going on about him is, is absolutely nothing. It's empty. It's worthless. It's lifeless. There's nothing there. And uh, one's faith is the same. It's just that there's nothing there. It's empty. There's absolutely no reality to it. But here's the thing. Turn that around. Put it the other way. If he is truly risen, then you'll see it. You'll see that there's something to the preaching and you'll see that, that there's, there's something substantial to that faith. It's not just nothing. It, it goes, goes beyond just psych, a psychological crutch or, or wishful thinking. That there, there is substance there. There is something there. It is genuinely life-changing. And so, brethren, on that basis, I submit to you, on that basis, I submit to you, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. And you know something? There is, there is clear evidence of that all around us. First of all, let's look at the preaching. The preaching of the gospel is not vain. Clearly not empty, vain, nothing there. It is proven to have incredible supernatural power. That's right. Sharing the truth. Incredible supernatural power. We're told in God's Word, Romans 10, 17, so that faith, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now, we're living in a world now in which, uh, you, you know, they say if you're going to get a message across, you've got to entertain the people. You've got to, uh, you've got to visually stimulate them. You've got to diversify, continually diversify to keep their attention. Modern technology has really kind of spoiled modern man. And now it's really reduced his attention span. So, uh, you know, the, the, you, the things have to keep moving, you know, and it's got to be stimulated. I mean, you see it in the movies now. They've got to keep moving, you know. Scenes are shorter. They're going from here to there to keep people's attention. I see it in my kids, like watching some of these old movies. They go too slow. 
and they just kind of get bored, you know? And so it, you see that, and, and in a world like that, nonetheless, there's the sharing of the Word of God, and I've seen it working in people's lives, just the sharing of the Word of God, working in people's lives. I've seen people just absolutely captivated by hearing the Word of God. It's like Paul says, I love the way he puts it in uh, 1 Corinthians 1.21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Wow, just sharing the truth out there. I can give you my own personal testimony along that line. I went to a church one Friday night and I was watching a movie of a guy giving a sermon. That was the whole movie. It was back in the day, you know. A big reel. Change reels. Wait a minute. There, you know. And this guy's giving his sermon on there. It changed my life. I sat there mesmerized by what this guy was saying and it changed my life. And I've seen that kind of thing over and over and over again, just sharing the truth of what Scripture says, God's Word, God's truth in a world out there, and there's, there's power that is inexplicable. Now, it, obviously not everyone, obviously not all the time. Every time I get up to share the Word, virtually every time, I see the sleepers. Yeah, I see you. <laughs> you know? It's just, you know, when's this going to be over? I was sharing one time, and there was a little 12-year-old 12 12 year girl with her mom sitting right here. And, and I was sharing the word, you know, and I, and I came to a point where we're right near the end of it, there was one more thing I wanted to say. And I said, just one more thing I want to share with you right now. And I saw this little 12-year-old girl just roll her eyes and go, oh, brother. <laughs> you know? But even then, even with the sleepers, our, uh, our former worship leader, Luke Lewis, he grew up in this church. And uh, he, his, his folks used to drag him here when he was in high school, junior high and high school, drag him, literally drag him to church. You will go to church this morning. And he would come down and he would sit, they would sit over in this area and he'd come and sit there. And you know what, what he would do? He had always wore a baseball cap. And when he would sit down there, he'd cross his arms and stick the cap down like this and just like that. He eventually became our worship leader. And I, and I remember those days, and we would talk about it. And he said, you know something, Brian? I was trying really not to hear. But the message was getting through. There's, there, there is a power there, brethren. It's like the Lord says, listen to this, Isaiah 11, 55, 11. So shall my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it will accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. He said, my, you know, my word will work that way. I've seen literally the sharing of the word effect miracles. I've heard of that. In fact, it's in Scripture in a case. In Acts chapter 14, verse 9 and 10, Paul and Barnabas are in, in the Greek city of Lystra, and, and then they're sharing right there in the open air, you know, at the gate of the city. And there was this lame man that was sitting there. He couldn't move. He couldn't go anywhere. He was stuck. He was lame. But what they were saying was penetrating, and it says this in verse 9 and 10 of Acts 14. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. This guy had never done that before. And he leaped and walked. He was instantly healed on the spot. Blew everybody away. That power in that word. I remember one time I was just sharing along the line of what God can do. The gifts and the power of God, you know, to minister, to heal, to help people and everything. And I was sharing one time, just, just off the cuff, you know, and, and, and sharing like, like, you know, how you could say, the, 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 somebody here has got it has got an ingrown toenail and God wants to heal it right now, you know, or something like that. And I'm just making just sort of an example off the top of my head. Next week, a guy called me up. He said, Brian, he said, I got to tell you. I said, yeah, what? He said, when you were given that example, you pointed right at me and I had an ingrown toenail. <laughs> and God healed it, Brian. 
But you know, those aren't the big healings. Those aren't the big healings. That's tinker toys. No, the really big ones are like this fellow Henry that I knew. He came to church one time and he just sat there. Out of somebody, but he'd never been in church before he came there and he sat and listened. And he came back and he came back and he came back and he came back and I got to know Henry. And I said, Henry, what happened? He said, the first Sunday I came in here, you were talking about the old man and the new man out of Ephesians. And I realized I was the old man and I wanted to be the new man. And just in his heart, he, in his heart where he was sitting, he just, Lord Jesus, make me the new man. Come in. Give me that life. Save me. And what a transformed life. To this day, that man who lives in Southern California now, just walking with the Lord. That's the, that's the big healing. That's when a soul goes from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan into the kingdom of God, from death into literal life, and that, and that eternally. That's, that's so the power of God. Not the power of the preacher. The power of God. Boy, the Lord's shown me that over the years many times. I think of a couple ways that kind of stand out in my mind. One was when I was asked to come down to Mexico and, and, and minister at a... Uh, actually, actually, it was in a very poor area of... of, uh, of um, I think Caliente. Is that, what's, what's right over the border from... Mexicali, yeah. And it was an extremely poor area. And he had a ministry there, and he said, he said would you come and share? And, and this guy himself was sort of a missionary from the States, and he was learning Spanish. He wasn't really proficient at it yet. He was just learning it. And I think what he wanted to do was he wanted to use me to practice, you know, translating so he got me, and we went down into this area, and all these people came, oh, gringo coming, let's go, you know, and they came, and they're all sitting around in this little hut, and, and I came in there, and, and my friend said, I'll translate for you, Brian, preach him. So I was preaching away, and I could tell he was struggling with the translation, and, and, and so it wasn't going too well, you know. I'm going in my mind, I'm saying, as I'm preaching, and he's sitting there and stuttering through a translation, and I see a lot of these people sort of scratching their head and looking at each other and going, well, you know, they're, they're trying to get it, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's very clear this isn't flying too well. And I'll never forget one little part. I was using an example of a gangster in New York who had come to Christ, and so I said the word gangster, and he didn't know what gangster in, in Spanish was. So he's going, ah, oh, I don't know that word. And he's looking, and he begins to explain to the people there as best he can in Spanish what word he's trying to describe. And it was so funny because they finally, you could see the light go on. Ding, oh, gangsta. <laughs> anyway, it was, it was something. And we got to the end of that little thing. And uh, I said, if you want to know Jesus... Talk to me. And, uh, you know, when service ended, and almost all those people gathered around and sat me down, and for two hours, two hours in that little place, as best we could, we shared, my friend translated, and these people were receiving the message of Jesus Christ with all their heart. Now, I share that with you to point out it was not me. I had nothing to do with that. That was something God was doing. I must say, despite me and my friend, he was doing a work in their hearts. Another example of that, early on in my ministry, I was asked to come and speak at what they called a youth rally down in Santa Ana, down in Southern California, a little church called the Neighborhood Church. We're having a youth rally. Brian, would you come and share? And I was going to share basically for the week in the evening. And so I went down there. I said, yeah, I'd love to. I went down there, and, and, and I'll never forget, you know, Monday night and Tuesday night I shared, you know, to this, in this youth rally, and, and it went really well. I mean, it was, you could see, you know, the, boy, this is really neat. What's going on here? And, and kids are responding, and some were accepting the Lord, you know, each night. It was pretty powerful. And, and I remember going home, and, and, uh, and on, it, was, uh, 
It was on, on Wednesday during the day. You know, a lady in our church, an older lady in our church, said, my brother's here and he really needs to talk to you, Brian, Pastor. Would you come over? And so I went over there and, and I met with him and I talked to him a little bit and prayed with him and everything. And, and, uh, and he, you know, he was not truly a believer, and, but, but talked and prayed with him, came back. Well, I was really excited. I felt like on a roll, on a high. This is really neat what's happening here. And I went down there Wednesday night to preach. And every, it was exactly the opposite of what it had been the first two nights. I mean, it was, it stunk. It was as flat as can be. It was a rotten egg of a message. And I'm sitting there going, and you know, you can always sort of say, well, it was still God's word. And, I, and, and you know, it's, it, 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 maybe it's just the way I felt. But afterwards, when the leadership got together and they're all scratching their head and going, what happened tonight? Everybody recognized it. Now, they didn't say anything. I just, I just felt very humble. And, uh, you know, I was in my mind, I was thinking, I'll tell you what happened tonight. I did not deliver. I just absolutely blew it big time tonight. And I felt like apologizing to everybody for the mess I had made of this ministry that I had done on Wednesday night, you know? And, and they're just sort of going, oh, what happened? And I was discouraged, man. I went away, and poor Joyce, I got home, you know, late that night. And, and Joyce, every night, she'd say, well, how'd it go? She shouldn't have asked that night. <laughs> but here's the thing. Next day, Thursday, I'm going to speak one more time. I get a call from the lady I'd seen the night before. <laughs> yeah. God bless the little squirt. <laughs> the lady called me. And uh, she said to me, I was at my office, and she said, Brian, you will never know what you did here yesterday. And I like looked at the telephone and the way I was feeling. I said, her name was June. I still remember that. June, if anything happened there at all, I want to go on. I want you to know I had nothing to do with it. And it's like God put stop action in my life right at that point. And it's just like the whole world stopped. Everything stopped. And God spoke so clearly to my heart right at that moment. He goes, there, Brian. If you're going to be my servant, that's the attitude you have to have. That's what you have to know. You have nothing to do with this. It's a work of God. And whoa. And it hit me deeper than it had ever hit me before. Oh, I was good at saying, praise the Lord. I know the Lord did that. I didn't do it. But that little voice in the back of your head, yeah, but you're still pretty good too, you know. That was gone. And I remember going that last night to speak to that place and I, feeling a sense of liberty. I was, I was set free. <laughs> okay, Lord, go and see what happens. See what you want to do there. I don't have anything to do with this. The cool thing about it was not only can I not take the credit, you know, the glory of it, but I can't take the blame either. It's <laughs> the Lord, you know. So I went there that night, and I want you to know, I mean, this was amazing. Everything that could have gone wrong went wrong that night. I went down there, and it was, it was kind of a small church. You know, it was in the summertime. They had the windows open in back. And, and so there was all the noise out there on the street, you know, that was coming, and I was trying to preach. I had a little music stand. I had this great big Bible and big notes. And as I'm preaching that night, for whatever reason, that night, oh, I know, because they did a play, and the pulpit was gone. They put up a little music stand. And so there wasn't room for my notes and my Bible, and I'd share some. Every time I turned around, my notes from my Bible were on the floor, you ever seen a Bible fall on the floor? It doesn't fall gracefully. It just goes like that, you know? And, and so I'm forever turning around. Oh, excuse me, picking up my stuff and putting it on there. About midway through the sermon, there's a, there, the pastor studies right, right next to the platform. The phone rings in the evening, and it's ringing and ringing and ringing. And finally, one of the ushers in the back walks around, and this guy, you know, probably felt like, well, this is my big moment. <laughs> And he's walking up there, you know, and I'm trying to preach the word. He goes in the back room. The walls are paper thin. So you hear this guy, neighborhood church. Yeah. No, he's not here right now while I'm preaching. <laughs> and he has this little conversation going on there, you know. It's like two stations at once, you know, going on the radio. You know, you're hearing them both kind of, you know. That's what's going on in that. And if that wasn't enough, 
If that wasn't enough, I'm getting near the end of the message and the entire Santa Ana Fire Department goes by on the street. I mean, the sirens going, the horns blaring, the, the windows are open, and it's just, you know, it's just drowning me out, you know. I don't know what else could have gone wrong. And that whole time in the midst of all of that, I could tell people were riveted to what I was saying. It was just, again, the opposite of what had happened the previous night. And when I got done, and I said, anyone want to receive the Lord? You know, come on up here. So many young people came forward. We didn't have enough people to work with them. I mean, it was like half the group came up. And we were just filled up the front of that church and everything. And I said, all I could do were so many of them just lead them in a word, in, in a prayer of receiving Jesus just all together. And we had that little moment up there. And I saw kids suddenly get up and walk over to a kid that they had had issue with and just giving him a hug, saying, please forgive me. And all that was going on spontaneously right in front of my eyes. And I'm going, Lord, you did something here. And it was so neat to say when people were coming up to me, Brian, that was awesome. Hey, <laughs> I had nothing to do with that. And I meant it. This was the Lord. You see, brethren, the preaching is not vain. No. No. There's the power of God involved in that. Indeed, indeed, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Brethren, if Christ is not risen, the preaching would just be empty, vain, nothing, worthless, useless, lifeless. And you know what? Most of you wouldn't even be here. So you know what I submit to you? Look around you. Look around you. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. And those, so that's the preaching, and the same is true of the faith itself. He said, you're preaching your faith. The faith is in vain either. Now, the preaching, I want you to know, can go forth in the power of the resurrection. It can go forth in the anointing of the Holy Spirit and still be missed. Still be missed. You know, it doesn't automatically mean it's going to be received by everyone. Jesus gave the parable of the sower, didn't he? Where the sower went out and was sowing, uh, the, you know, the, his, his wheat out there. And he said to the people, some fell on the roadside, and the birds just came and took it away. And some fell on rocky ground. And it sprang up, but it didn't have any root to it, and, and it just wilted away and died in short order. Some fell out there where the weeds were and the thorns and thistles, and then that got choked out, and it didn't do anything, and... But some fell on good soil, and boy, did that produce fruit. Whoo. And the disciples afterward and said, would you explain to us what you were saying in that parable? And he did. And he said, you know what? That seed is like the Word, the Word of God's kingdom, the Word of God, and it's being thrown out there. It's being thrown out and scattered out to people. But there's some, their heart, man, it's just like that road. And the, and the, old, the old devil comes in there, and, you know, he doesn't come with, with horns and a pitchfork, you know, and a, and a tail or anything. He just comes in that subtle little voice, and you don't believe that, do you? Come on, give me a break. That's archaic. That's old stuff. <laughs> Forget that. I don't, I don't believe that. It plucks it right out. And then there's, the, 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 then, then there's the, the, the stony ground. It falls on there, and it goes, and, and, and that heart receives it. It goes, wow, wow, that's cool. I like that. Yes, you know, and it, it sort of buys into it. But then it goes out, and you know what Jesus said? Trials. Persecution. Hit. And the attitude becomes, wait a minute, I didn't sign up for this. This is not cool. No, this isn't for me. And he said some fell on that weedy ground. And the weedy ground, whoa, hoo, 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 Jesus said, that's the cares of this world. That's that attitude that, uh, that goes, you know what? I just haven't got time for that. I think it's cool, you know, maybe I... Believe it, but I don't have time for it. There's too many more important things going, crowding into my life that need to be taken care of. Jesus called it in one place the deceitfulness of riches. 
Riches deceive us. Feeling, I need this. Or, this is, you know, th- th- this is my security. I've got to work on my security. Or, or, you know, I've got this project I've got to do. I've got to get this house built. or Whatever the case may be. It may be, this is, is what we need. This is, this is what's going to make us happy. That's deceitful. All the above is deceitful. Jesus said, you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Put that first. And those things will be added to you. I've got you covered. You know? But the deceitfulness of riches chokes it out, he said. But some of it falls on good soil. That's at heart that says, I believe that, I receive that. And I'm hanging in there with my faith and my trust in the risen Jesus Christ as Lord and the Savior of my life. And he said, there's fruit. There is fruit there in that life. That faith is not vain. It'll, it'll produce, you know. It'll, it'll bear fruit in, 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 that, in its own life, and it'll bear fruit in the effect it has on other people's lives. John said in 1 John 5, 4 and 5, the Word of God, For whatever is born of God, that's somebody that's received Christ and been born again by faith in Him. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God? That's pretty simple. It's faith applied in the risen and living Jesus Christ who is there. It's not vain. It's not empty. It's not nothing because Jesus is alive and because he is the Lord and because he is there. That makes it real. That makes it alive. And I've seen it. I've seen when somebody has embraced that faith in Jesus Christ, which is all the Bible asks you to do, embraces that faith in Jesus Christ. I've seen it bring a deep sense of the forgiveness of God. Oh, how we need that. We had a lady come and share one time at one of our women's breakfasts years ago. Just a fiery, redhead, attractive lady. And, and she gave her testimony at that meeting. And in her testimony, she had been actually, uh, you know, a, 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 a bar dancer, you know, in one of these bars and just living on the wild side. And she got married to this guy, married young. And their marriage was a wreck. It was a mess. And he was working at nights. And, and she was doing this particular job. And they had, well, they, they had finally, where they had a couple of small children, you know, a little, a, I don't know, a little boy or a little girl that was probably about four years old and then a little baby. And she said her life was so empty. She went and she was just miserable. And she was at the bar. And this guy from Texas who was obviously a businessman got to striking up a conversation with this beautiful redhead and talking to her, and she's just unloading her miserable life. And he said, hey, listen, I like you. Why don't you come back to Texas with me? I'll take care of you, and I'll take care of your kids. That's all she needed to hear. She said, well, he said, listen, you go home when you get off work, gather your stuff, First thing in the morning, I'll drive by your house even before your husband gets home. And we'll, we'll take off. You need a better life. I can provide that. I'll do it. She went home. She's frantically packing stuff to take. And she, it's, baby wakes up and begins to cry. And it's crying away. And she says, forget it. You can just you go back to sleep. I'm busy. That baby cried a long time. And she just ignored it. She went about, finally it stopped crying after a long time. You know, they do that. She was all ready to go. She just got a little bit of sleep that night. Early in the morning, before her husband got home, she got up, you know, their, their older child. She said, let's go. We're going to go now. We're going to go get a new life. I want you to go wake up the baby. Was gone. She's gathering her stuff at the front door. The little child comes back and said, the baby won't wake up. What? She goes in there. The baby was dead. You know, that crib death. Of course, that that brought everything to a screeching halt. 
she didn't go with that guy. And she, she was doubly destroyed. She felt she killed her own baby. Baby. Oh, if only I had come and embraced that child. Interesting thing was this sort of helped their marriage as they grieved together. And she didn't know until later that her husband felt he had killed the baby. What was I doing? Going out and working hours like that? I should have been home. I should have had another job. I should have been there for my family. Well, there was a lady in the neighborhood who kept saying to this, this girl, inviting her week after week after week, come to church with me, come to church with me. Why don't you come to church with me? Well, she was at a point. Now, she'd always said, oh, thank you, thank you, maybe one of these days. She was at a point, well, she said, okay, I'll go. And they went to this church, this little neighborhood church, and they're sitting in church and everything, and the preacher gets up there to give his message, and he starts giving his message. And interestingly enough, his message was on the forgiveness of God. And he says, whatever your life's been and whatever's happened in your life, God can and will and desires to forgive you right now through Jesus Christ. You need his forgiveness, and his forgiveness is available to you right now. That so resonated in her heart. She's sitting kind of near the back with her friend. So resonated in her heart. She didn't know proper procedure at church, and that's all she needed to hear. She got up, middle of his sermon, just at that point in his sermon, walked down the center aisle crying, walked down to him in the center aisle crying, and he had the wherewithal and the presence of mind to realize, okay, I think God's doing something here. And come on down. And, they got, and he just prayed that simple little prayer. We call it the sinner's prayer. Oh, Jesus, oh, I need you. My life's a wreck. And I need your forgiveness. And she prayed that with all of her heart. Now, this is the thing. She knew immediately something happened there. Something happened in her heart, in her life. And she went back and she sat down for the rest of that service. And she felt like she was literally a new person. And when the service was over, you know, and she was walking home, she said, I couldn't believe it. The trees were greener than I had ever seen them before. The flowers were, 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 were brighter and more colorful. And you know what? I heard the birds singing. I, they, they were singing, and I'm convinced they were, they were praising God with their songs. She just, you know, it blew, she was a new person. That so transformed her life. Her husband going, okay, we're going to church Sunday. I want to find out what's going on here. He went down there, and the very next Sunday gave his heart to Christ, largely because of the effect of his wife that week and the transformation that had taken place in her life. And she said, the Lord has restored our home, our family, uh, given them more children, and, uh, and she was there to share with us the new life that, that she had in Christ, brethren. Uh, that's, that, you can't explain that, apart from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I've seen him bring incredible comfort, you know, incredible comfort. I was watching TV years ago. It was, you'll, I'll date myself on this one. It, it was the Detroit riots back in the, in the 60s. And I was watching the news on TV, and it looked like the city of Detroit was on fire. And then the interviewer, National News, this black middle-aged gentleman, and he was saying, it was explaining, this man right here, it was during the Vietnam War, about a year ago lost one of his two sons in Vietnam. Well, just this last year, just recently, his second remaining son was killed in Vietnam. Last week, he was laid off General Motors. And last night, his house and all his belongings burned to the ground. So he looked at this middle-aged black gentleman and basically said, what now? and handed the mic, stuck the mic in front of his face. I'll never forget. I wish I could quote it verbatim, but I can sure tell you what he said. I'll never forget that. He said, the Lord has gotten us through all of this, and he will get us through this also. That was his comment. 
Really? Wow. Now to him, Scripture says, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or even think through Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's what we're talking about. It means new life. That's why I enjoy so much our communion service when we have that time and the body kind of share together and to hear what God is doing in different ways. You sort of open it up to the body. Hear what God is doing in different people's lives. And all of this is grounded and based in his resurrection and the assurance as God's gift to us of eternal life. And so, brethren... I've seen uh, clear evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ all around. All around us. Clear evidence to this day. So I can, I can say to you assuredly, not just based on history, not just based on what Scripture says, not just based on the empirical evidence of it, but based on what I see around me. He is risen. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so, uh, to me, that's seeing the resurrection for yourself. It's what I entitled the message here. And so I can tell you assuredly, he is trustworthy. He's a trustworthy to save that eternal soul of yours and get you to heaven. He's trustworthy to do that by trusting in him to do it. He's trustworthy to overcome on your behalf whatever the world may throw at you whenever it may throw it at you. He's trustworthy to do that. He said all things work together for good to those that love God and been called according to his purpose. So the point is faith in Christ is not vain. It's not in vain because he is risen. He is risen indeed. So who are you going to trust with your life? I know I've got quite a group here. Who are you going to trust with your life? What are you going to trust with your life, with your eternal soul? You're going to, you're, you're going to trust your, yourself? You're going to trust your own thinking? Are you going to sit there, well, you know, Brian, Pastor, this is kind of the way I feel about this, or this is, this is what I think. Are you going to trust that for life and for eternity? Is that what you're going to trust? That's flimsy. Or are you going to trust somebody else's? Well, this is what I think. I mean, maybe he seems like a real together person. He seems like a holy man. It, you know, whatever the case may be. I'll trust what he thinks, you know. You're going to trust that? That's just as flim- flimsy. Or are you going to trust he who came and declared himself to be the son of the living God, who said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody else has said that, by the way. And he rose from the dead to prove his conquest of death for you and I. And that faith in him and the gift of eternal life is the real thing. You're going to trust the living person who's conquered death? You're going to trust one of these others. Who are you going to trust? Where are you going to put your faith? I challenge you to put your faith in the living Jesus Christ and make no bones about it. And I want to say one last thing as we wrap this up about that faith that is not vain. We're not talking about believing in the existence of Jesus Christ. Any more than a person can believe in the existence of airplanes and and yet stepping into one takes them to a new level. It takes a step of faith in that airplane to step into it. You've got to put your trust in it. You know, it's not about believing in the existence of Jesus Christ. He says it's faith in him. It's that step of putting your trust and faith in him for life. Not just fire insurance for eternity, but for life, for this life, for your future. Your future here in this life as well as over there for all eternity. That, that is the faith that's not vain.
It's never vain. It's life. Because he is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are God. The design of all creation is so incredible. It declares an amazing eternal designer. And it is to you, God, Father in heaven, that we pray. And today we want to thank you that you've invaded human life in the person of Jesus Christ himself to save and save eternally the likes of us, each one. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, here is truth, here is life, here is hope. We thank you. This Easter morning, we thank you for that truth, that life, that eternal hope that is in our Lord and our Savior, Jesus. Thank you that a personal relationship with him, because he's alive and he's the Lord, is the real thing. Thank you. It's in his name we pray. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen.